uh, so hello everyone uh, i hope i'm audible yes yeah thank you okay uh, let's start the today's session so in today's session uh, we'll be looking at the contents of week 2 which is related to the uh, errors sources of errors and uh, how to correct some of those errors so i have started the recording uh, so let me go to the presentation okay okay so uh, just to for a quick recap uh, we can uh, just go through the what we saw in last week uh, uh, session so first we saw what is remote sensing what are the types of remote sensing active and passive then what is the role of remote sensing uh, and its applications then we saw what is the physical basis of uh, remote sensing which is the interaction of electromagnetic radiation uh, with the target objects then we saw the electromagnetic spectrum then we saw what are the components of remote sensing uh, there are uh, several components we saw all the, most of the components and then we saw what are the data formats and uh, how the data is being recorded then the most important thing which we discussed is the uh, four different types of resolution which is uh, spatial spectral temporal and radiometric resolution then we saw uh, the interaction of uh, electromagnetic radiation with the target so reflection refraction scattering and absorption are the processes through which the electromagnetic radiation interacts with the atmosphere and as well as the target and finally we saw the atmospheric energy matter interactions where we saw uh, path 1 to path 5 uh, these are the unwanted paths uh, uh, which are uh, from which the energy is being recorded in our sensor and uh, finally we saw what are uh, what are the spectral reflectance curve or the spectral signature so i hope uh, the session was uh, uh, useful and uh, it was uh, helpful to solve your assignments as well now moving on to uh, today's session so we'll be seeing uh, the sources of errors so as discussed by uh, uh, professor in the video lectures uh, the different sources of errors are listed here first is the atmospheric error which arises due to the interaction of uh, electromagnetic radiation with the atmosphere then we have our uh, geometry error uh, because the earth is also rotating and the satellite is also moving in its orbit uh, we have uh, different uh, types of geometry error then uh, we have the topographic error because of the slope our images are generally planimetric in nature but earth has a curvature and there are different features on the earth which has uh, uh, slopes so we have topographic error also then we have the radiometric error uh, which is uh, due to the uh, sensor uh, some pixels might not get recorded or some lines of pixel some rows of pixel may not get recorded and uh, we have the source sensor uh, geometry error uh, the sensor might uh, go out of calibration and uh, with time also it uh, deteriorates then uh, we saw the there is also adjacency effect uh, because of some nearby object uh, we also get some error in our measurements and the field of view uh, this is mainly for the across track uh, satellite like a uh, modis uh, which might introduce uh, some geometric errors and uh, before going into uh, today's uh, class uh, first we need to see what is uh, surface reflectance uh, br i briefly uh, discussed this in the last session so surface reflectance uh, is unitless and it is the ratio of the reflected radiance from the target object to the incoming solar radiation so it is uh, unitless so this we need to uh, keep in uh, mind so firstly we'll be uh, uh, going through uh, uh, what is uh, stacking then what is true color composite and what is uh, false color composite so we have uh, uh, if you look at our uh, uh, satellite data so i have uh, the downloaded landsat data here if you can see so we have different bands so these are all uh, separate separate files but when we are doing some analysis what we will do is we will arrange them Uh, one by one uh, in a single uh, data so that process is called as uh, stacking so here it is the process of uh, combining uh, 
multiple separate bands in order to produce a new multiband image which is a single image and this type of multiband image is useful for uh, visualization so we will see how it is useful and for uh, stacking uh, we uh, the most important thing is all our data uh, extent the geographical extent uh, should be the same it should have the same number of uh, rows and columns so that uh, we can do the uh, stacking so here i have uh, shown in this picture i have shown uh, nar band of landsat 8 and it is only a single band and you can see a small uh, uh, feature here because there are n number of uh, no data values uh, the zeros are uh, very high that's why this uh, raster histogram is very small uh, these are the recorded values uh, which is uh, from the nar band of uh, landsat 8 and uh, we saw the different uh, bands uh, band 2 to uh, band 6 we have and uh, we can stack it uh, in QGIS so here if you can see uh, this is uh, one of the tool which I'll be demonstrating shortly it is called as uh, building a virtual raster so if we go into that here you can see uh, here it is a prompt we can place each of the input file into a separate band so we just need to uh, check this option and then we need to select the data so we have band 2 band 3 band 4 and band 5 so these are our inputs and we need to check this option then when we run this tool what it will do is it will give a single image and the most important uh, uh, thing as, as well as uh, when somebody is uh, starting remote sensing for the first time uh, they will get confused like uh, how to uh, uh, remember this order this order will confuse so we can just simply remember in terms of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum not the band number so here b2 corresponds to blue b3 corresponds to green b4 corresponds to red and b5 corresponds to the nar band so instead of removing 2 3 uh, 4 5 we, we need to remember blue green red and nar so why i am saying is you will understand in the next slide so here we are uh, stacking so after the stacking process you can see now it has become a single file and you can see four different uh, uh, histograms here individual histograms so each corresponding to each of the band which we gave it as input so why i told to remember in terms of emr spectrum because here you can see the number has changed band 1 band 2 band 3 and band 4 so what we have given is 2 3 4 5 but the output is 1 2 3 4 so we just need to remember that uh, the way in which we are giving the input here whatever is the order that is showing here that is the order it will be arranged in your output so here b1 corresponds to blue b2 corresponds to green 3 to red and band 4 to near infrared and if you see the properties you can see something called as multiband color and here you have red band green band blue band and here we can change how we are going to visualize so anybody has a doubt up to this point So somebody has asked any specific reason the band changes for blue band no the band uh, i don't know uh, can you please elaborate the question uh, you can unmute yourself and ask am i audible yeah yeah yeah, see, uh, in the first screen, you said that uh, band 2 corresponds to blue. Yes. And uh, and continuously, in, in sequence, uh, band 2, band 3, uh, with the respective bands. Yeah. But in the second screen, you said uh, band 1 corresponds to blue. Yes. So, any specific reason there, uh, I got a bit confused, confused over there. Okay. Uh, let me just show you here.
so this is Landsat 8 data and I am in the website of uh, USGS where, from where we can uh, get the data. So if you see here, band 1 of Landsat corresponds to coastal aerosol, band 2 is blue, 3 is green, 4 is red, 5 is NIR. Okay? This you understood? Okay. So and is this specific to uh, satellite configuration? Yes, exactly. Each satellite has their own list. Okay. okay. So I have downloaded the Landsat 8 data. So I have downloaded 2, 3, 4 and 5 only. Okay. But in general, when we speak, right, uh, with respect to the uh, like uh, atmospheric level, so it, it uh, below will start first, right? Not uh, necessarily. Uh, it can be uh, coastal aerosol also. It depends on okay. the satellite. Okay. So all these are bands will be available in the environment, but uh, based on the yeah, yeah. satellite? How the satellite is recording, it, it can change across different products. Okay. Thank you. So here we have uh, four bands. Uh, excuse but, me. Uh, yes. uh, that means you want to say that band number changes from satellite to satellite. Yeah. You here. I'll just show here itself. Uh, this is Landsat 8-9. Then you can see Landsat 7. Here there is no coastal aerosol band at all. Band 1 is blue, band 2 is green, red, NIR. And if I go further above, Landsat 4-5, it is uh, similar to uh, Landsat uh, 7, I think uh, one band will be introduced, I think. Panchromatic is new in this. If you see, Landsat 7 has panchromatic, uh, but Landsat 4 does not have panchromatic. And if I go further up, you can see uh, band 4 is green here. And if you see here, band 2 is green. So it will vary across uh, different satellites. So we should always remember, we should not remember the band number. We should remember this, what is the property it is recording. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that is the band which I showed in the first slide. But how uh, QGIS uh, does is, whatever is the order which is uh, displayed here, whatever the order in which we are giving here. So from the top, it will start. This will be band one, band two, band three, band four. So if I go to the next slide, so your band one corresponds to blue, band two corresponds to green, then red, then near infrared. So uh, like how we are arranging that we should remember or note it down somewhere so that uh, when we keep doing the analysis, uh, we will not get confused which band is what. So let me just uh, quickly uh, do this uh, stacking. So I am opening the QGIS. So this is how the QGIS uh, window looks like. And uh, firstly, uh, we need to download the data. I have uh, uploaded all this data set in the Google Drive also. Later when the video is uploaded, uh, you can uh, look at the video again and you can uh, try for yourself. Um, I'll, I have shared the data as well. So I'm going to import uh, this uh, TIF file. So the satellites are, uh, satellite images uh, are in TIF file. So band 2 to band 5, I'm just going to drag and drop here. So this is how the uh, Landsat has captured the image. This black areas are the no data values and this is uh, near uh, Chennai. Okay. So what I am going to do is I am going to create a stack. So for that, first we need to go to raster, then go to miscellaneous, then build virtual raster. So when you click that, you will get this uh, tool. Then here first is the input layers. So I'm just clicking here. So this order, how we are going to arrange, we can uh, drag and drop also. Now band three became first, band two became second. So we can drag and drop. So I am arranging it in two, three, four and five. Then we just need to select everything and then click okay. And here we need to click on please uh, place uh, each input into a separate band. So if you do not do this, all the uh, 
uh, band, all the files will be merged into a single uh, uh, raster and you will not get the multi-band raster. So and then I am just giving run. And here you can uh, uncheck all the other layers so that it will be hidden. So this is how the uh, stack layer looks like. So here you can see band 1, band 2, band 3. So now we can visualize. Uh, so what we have to do is we need to double click. It will open this uh, dialog box. Then if you go to symbology, you can see multiband color. And now, now we have created the stack. Now next what we are going to do is we are going to see what is called as uh, true color composite and what is uh, false color composite. So our stack has uh, four bands but at a time we can only uh, see the combination of uh, three bands that is uh, red, green and uh, blue because our eyes can only perceive uh, these three colors which is in the uh, visible spectrum. Our eyes cannot perceive any other uh, color. So if I uh, give the red band as uh, so I am going to call this particular thing as channel. So this is a red channel, this is green channel, then this is blue channel. So if I assign red band to red channel, green band to green channel and blue band to blue channel. So that is what I have written here. So rendering the red band as red channel, green band as green channel and blue band as blue channel, you will get a true color composite. This is how the actual image looks like when the satellite captured it. So you can see lot of uh, haze in this image. Now we are going to make a false color composite. So in this what we are going to do is we are assigning the NIR band to the red channel, the red band to the green channel and green band to the blue channel and if we render it we will get the false color composite. So this is how the image looks after the false color composite uh, is made and you can see lot of red patches and if you remember in the last week session I would have discussed that vegetation reflects highest in the NIR band. So if you see this uh, green color patches it will be com completely vegetation. I will just show that uh, in few seconds. So what I am going to do is I am going to uh, make a false color composite. So our band 4 is NIR then band 3 is red then band 2 is uh, green. So I am just going to give apply and you got the false color composite. Now I am just going to make a overlay of a Google satellite picture. So I am going to zoom in one of the red patches and uh, you can see it is completely forest. So any doubts until this point? Is it confusing? Yes. True color I understood because yeah. uh, based on the analysis what we require to do is uh, what is the surface on what we have uh, exactly on the surface of the earth we will be yeah. getting through images and then we, we get to know exactly those those colors. But yeah. uh, where is the application of uh, false uh, uh, band uh, selection? So in which uh, uh, where we exactly need this kind of uh, false color? Yeah because uh, we will not be able to visualize uh, NIR band like this right so if I put the band 4 sorry the band 5 so from this uh, will you be able to differentiate uh, which is what it is not possible right and even if you put a true color composite we cannot uh, quantify like uh, how the vegetation is going to behave. So later in the digital uh, image classification, we will see something called as a NDVI. So we will see the application of this uh, false color composite and everything uh, in that, uh, I think next week. Okay. 
so here uh, since we have put uh, nir as the red channel so whatever places it is showing dark red so those places are dense vegetation we can simply by visually we can say that these red patches are uh, vegetation and this red patches are agriculture where you will also have crops so these are all agricultural area there also we will have crops so wherever vegetation is there it will appear red so simply by visually we can say this much of vegetation is there in this particular area so from where the images are taken so i will share all this details at the end of the lecture so i will say from where i have downloaded this image uh, anybody has any other doubts so this true color composite false color composite is clear yes is uh, it is clear but uh, can we change that near infrared also yes so for the so what uh, i have displayed here is called as standard false color composite so when i say standard false color composite your red band will have nir the your red channel will have nir then green channel will have yeah. red and blue channel will have green but there are okay. many other false color composite also which okay. is used for different different applications so uh, i think if you see some textbooks they would have given for mineral okay, expansion yeah so what i have shown here is okay. called as standard false color composite okay thank you sir thank yeah. you so we can move on to the next part so next is the atmospheric correction so you you saw this previous image uh, where there is a lot of uh, haze in this image so we need to definitely correct it for uh, the interaction with the atmosphere uh, to quantify our uh, uh, to for accurate quantification of uh, the values which are recorded so why is it required so we need to accurately quantify the surface reflectance because each material is behaving differently and uh, each material will have its own spectral signature so if the values are uh, modified because of this atmospheric uh, error then uh, we will not be able to get accurate quantification and atmospheric correction helps to recover the true reflectance value of the earth surface and the target objects and uh, why is it important to make a meaningful comparison between different images taken at different times because the atmosphere uh, uh, condition changes every time uh, in a very short time so we need to correct it for the atmosphere and it is important for the parameter estimation so we have different indices uh, like ndvi then uh, savi all these indices we will see uh, so in order to estimate uh, these parameters everything depends on your uh, surface reflectance so it is important to make accurate uh, quantification of it and land cover classification and uh, other environmental monitoring studies so uh, there are two types of uh, atmospheric uh, correction one is the absolute atmospheric correction the second one is the relative atmospheric correction so in absolute atmospheric correction so first uh, we know that the solar radiation interacts with the earth's atmosphere and it is uh, scattered and absorbed and we have some uh, energy loss in it and it is called as atmospheric attenuation and because of uh, this uh, attenuation it is difficult for us to compare whatever the satellite is recording with the our uh, in site in situ measurement that is we'll be measuring some data on field as well and it will be difficult to make comparison so we need to uh, relate the in situ measurement as well as the satellite measurement and come up with a correction factor so we will see that shortly and we uh, we should also extend the spectral signature through the space and time so for the entire geographical area 
we need to uh, it should have the same kind of uh, spectral signature and the goal of the atmospheric correction is to convert the digital brightness values recorded into a scaled surface reflectance and then these values once corrected can be used for our uh, further analysis and we have uh, advanced uh, uh, correction algorithms which are acon atcor atrem and flush this was discussed in the video lectures as well i am not going into uh, detail and we have another method called as empirical line calibration so we will see uh, how this empirical line calibration works so in this uh, what we will do is a satellite will record the data and uh, during the same time at which it is recording we will also measure some of the targets on the ground by using the uh, uh, field spectro radiometer and we will compare both these data and make a linear regression this is the equation of a straight line so your left hand side is the brightness value then rho is the reflectance a is one uh, constant and b is one constant we call a as the multiplicative constant and b as the additive constant or you can also say a as uh, gain and b as offset so this is nothing but the basic equation radiance is equal to uh, sorry reflectance is equal to uh, corrected reflectance is equal to the top of atmospheric uh, ref reflectance into uh, gain plus offset the same equation is represented in a different way and where can we find this uh, constant uh, ak and bk because uh, they are not going to uh, uh, provide it uh, directly so it will be given in the metadata of the downloaded satellite product so i will show the met metadata So while downloading the data itself, you will have some uh, text files. So whatever the text file that ends with the underscore MTL, that is your metadata. So I am going to open this metadata and uh, you can see some uh, information is given. We will see what the information is. Just now I am just showing what is the uh, metadata and uh, how it looks like. So this is what I was saying. So these are the kind of field measurement uh, which is being done. So these are black and white targets, uh, a bright target and a dark target. And this is the handheld uh, spectro radiometer through which we'll do the uh, in situ measurements. Then once we uh, do both the measurements, we will plot it. Uh, here we have the wavelength and here you have the radiance. So bright target, this is the field measurement and this is the satellite measured data and you have the dark target, uh, field measurement and the satellite measured data. What we are going to do, we are going to make a linear regression and once we fit a straight line to it, we will get the scale and the offset values. So that is how we get this uh, uh, multiplicative constant and the additive constant. Anyone has any doubt? This, uh, or one second. Yeah. Uh, scale and offset, right? Uh, yeah. So, see, uh, with respect to the guy who is analyzing the um, images, right? So yes. he, he doesn't need to worry about that, but <coughs> that will be provided uh, prior, right? It will be available for him. Yeah, it will be available. Okay, but so this one, right? Scale and offset, uh, like at which, at which, uh, 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 what do you say? Situation, this will be. <coughs> created or, or uh, like uh, generated so this will be already done by the people who are uh, doing the satellite program so they will do all this uh, calibration and everything and the final product that we are getting they will just uh, give this uh, values so that we can uh, convert the measured radiance to the actual radiance so this scale and offset right it remains uh, 
consistently same for uh, 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 on the level of satellite or uh, no no that, it uh, it differs from uh, space uh, uh, place to place and it differs from time also at which time they are going okay. to measure it because okay. your sun is uh, uh, your uh, sun angle and everything changes no right okay. so it will be different at different times so they will make a calibration uh, by making n number of measurements and then they will give us the coefficients okay for each epoch it will be a uh, different uh, scale in fs yes right? yes so whatever i am uh, saying the coefficients the metadata everything will be different for different different satellites we just need to uh, open it and then go through what is given in the particular uh, text file and then uh, do the corrections accordingly okay we'll continue with the session so in this uh, where we can find the uh, coefficients so if i come down so you can see uh, just a minute so here you can see group is equal to radiometric rescaling so this is this is the coefficients that we are saying when you are going to when your product uh, has a dn value in terms of radians you can use this coefficients so from here to here so mult is the multiplication factor add is the addition factor and it is given for each band so band 1 to band 11 multiplication factor then again band 1 to band 11 additive factor for radians and if you download the data which is uh, top of atmosphere reflectance then you have the corresponding uh, calibration factor reflectance multiplication factor and reflectance additive factor and this is also given for each band okay okay now we'll do a quick uh, manual calculation so we need to find the calibrated uh, radians for this particular pixel and uh, this is the formula which was uh, discussed in the lecture so i want everyone to take some 2 uh, uh, minutes just uh, see this question and then uh, find out uh, tell me what are these values and then we can calculate the calibrated radians so i want everyone to say what is uh, q cal max q cal min then what is q cal then l min l max from this question so if you completed you can uh, type in the answer Q cal max and uh, these are same. Okay. Uh, calculated for uh, this pixel. Sorry. So calculated for this particular pixel.
okay for this question what is uh, l min and uh, l max L min is uh, 17, uh, 394 and L max would be 256.3. Okay. Can someone say what is L min and uh, L max for this question? Okay, I'll give a hint. So you can think in terms of number of bits and its uh, range. So you have uh, 2 power 1, then 2 power 2, then so on up to we have 2 power 8 and then it can continue to higher orders also <coughs> 1 and 255 Okay, but uh, are the values between 1 and 255 in this image? The given question does not have values between 1 and 255. So, what is the next range? So generally, uh, whenever uh, a satellite is recording data, uh, the range that we will use is 16-bit uh, range. So that will be 2 power uh, 16 minus 1, that is 0 to 65,535. So this is the 16-bit range. So from this question, uh, we can just only guess because the values are not between 0 to 255. So it is exceeding that. So what is the next probable range? Next probable range after 2 power 8 is 2 power 16 only. So we can say, we can assume that uh, the given uh, range is uh, 2 power 0 to 65,535. So your uh, L min is 0 and your L max is uh, 65535. Now can you quickly compute and tell me? So in this question your L max will be
17394 then your qcal max is 65535 then qcal minus uh, 0 then qcal will be 255 255555 and uh, when you compute it So your calibrated radiance uh, will be 18419.86. So did someone get this answer? Hello. Did everyone understand? Hello? Hello? Yeah? Hello, sir. Yeah. Actually, uh, sir, I, uh, I don't understand Q, Q max and Q minimum. <coughs> Q max and Q minimum. Okay. So, uh, in the video lecture, if you remember, there was a similar example, and there the Q cal max and Q cal min was between 0 to 255, right? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Why it was two on, uh, 0 to 255 is because the given image, all your uh, this values, the brightness values, varies between 0 to 255 only but in this particular question all your brightness values are exceeding 255 so that could have been a probably a 8 bit image so it was only 0 to 255 this probably could be a 16 bit image so what you need to take is 2 power 16 minus 1 so that will be 0 to 65535. So, this is the range of 16-bit uh, data. Okay, but sir, how we understood that it is 2 raised to power 16 or 2 raised to power uh, 8? Yeah, here you can see the brightness value, right? These are all more than 255. All more than 255? Yeah, everything is more than 255 here. Uh, sir, how to identify this? Is it more than or not? So it will be given, so if I go to my data, so I am going to band 5 data, so I am going to properties, information, so here it is given, right? Okay. See, you can see int 16 bit unsigned integer and you can see what is the maximum value, then you can see what is the minimum value, everything will be available in the data itself. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Regarding Q cal. Q cal. Q cal is the. Yes. So Q cal is the value for which we are going to find out the calibrated radiance. It will be given in the question that find yeah, calibrated that, radiance for this. Yeah, it will be given in this question for this particular question. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, I hope this problem is clear to everyone. Yes, sir. Okay. We can move to the next. <clears throat> so, whatever we saw here was uh, radiance. So, which has a unit of a watt per meter square per steradian. Now, what we are going to do is, we are going to convert this radiance to reflectance at the top of atmosphere. 
so you should remember reflectance at the top of atmosphere so for that uh, this equation was uh, discussed in the <coughs> class so radiance at top of the atmosphere is equal to pi into radiance multiplied by the distance between earth and sun in astronomical unit and uh, here you have the exo atmosphere uh, that is exo atmospheric spectral irradiance for a particular wavelength and you have the solar zenith angle cos z is solar zenith angle so now uh, from where to uh, get all this uh, values so l lambda is uh, will be available in your uh, data your pixel value it may be l lambda but where to find this uh, e sun i and uh, this solar zenith angle so first i will say where we can find this uh, e sun i so here i have uh, given a table so this is again from the usgs website itself if you put, if you search for uh, exo atmospheric spectral irradiance for landsat just if you type that in google you will get a website uh, usgs website and for different landsat mission you can see here <coughs> landsat 754125 and for different bands you have this e sun i value so in this question maximum radiance observed in the nir band of uh, landsat 7 level 1 data is this much value and for this much uh, radiance we are going to find out what is the top of atmosphere reflectance and distance between the earth and the sun in astronomical unit that is also given here and sun elevation is uh, given it is not solar zenith angle it is sun elevation uh, they both are different and we need to find out what is the reflectance at the top of atmosphere okay uh, everyone understood everyone understood from where we are getting this uh, e sun i value let's see from where we can get this uh, solar zenith angle so if i go to the metadata again you need to refer the metadata only so for anything uh, you can refer the metadata so if i scroll up okay, i think it is at the bottom yeah you can see here right <coughs> so you can see uh, two angles are given one is uh, sun azimuth and uh, sun elevation so what i have given is i have given uh, the sun elevation in the question and you can also see the earth sun distance that is uh, your small d that is also given here so this two information we can get from the metadata now what is sun elevation sun elevation is the so the sun elevation is the angle between the direction of the sun and the line perpendicular to the earth surface at a specific location and time it is measured above the horizon horizon means it is with respect to your horizontal at what angle is the sun so if i uh, draw it so let us say if this is the horizon and uh, your sun is here so from the and this is your uh, target object so what is this angle so that is your sun angle but what angle we want is we want solar zenith angle which is uh, with respect to your nadir so it is the complementary angle to the sun elevation angle and it is the angle between direction of sun and the line pointing 
directly upward perpendicular to the earth surface so this particular angle from the uh, perpendicular this is your solar zenith angle so whatever angle i have given you need to subtract 90 from it and then you will get the solar zenith angle so this is the relation solar zenith angle plus sun elevation angle equals 90 degree so from this you can calculate the uh, solar zenith angle now can you try to solve this problem Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, there are so many rows in that metadata file, and and those row uh, those rows are uh, mainly given by the band wise, like band one for the 20 30 rows and band two for 20 30 rows. So how can we uh, <coughs> identify that that particular row is uh, uh, we want for for our expression or that? So we cannot uh, define anything like that because uh, we just need to go through the uh, line by line. So we okay. cannot say it will be in this particular line, it will be in this section, uh, it will differ. Okay. So we just need to go through. This is sun Nazimuth is given, sun elevation is given, earth the sun distance is given. So we just need to go through one by one. And these uh, these all are for that land set data only if we use copernicus or some uh, other satellite then yeah it will be different uh, metadata file uh, the format the same uh, process? yeah same process is same but uh, the from where we are taking the data that will be different okay okay <coughs> because that kind of mathematical equation is tough for me for <laughs> i i truly uh, um, Tell, 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 tell you, but I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Ah, sir, uh, sir, in this question, actually, uh, lambda is already given, na? <coughs> wavelength, land set, wavelength. So your uh, radiance is given. So this is uh, your radiance. L lambda. Seven. Uh, L lambda <coughs> is given. Yes, we need to find out what is the reflectance. Uh -huh. And sir, uh, then the distance between these two all is also given. Only we have to find the uh, uh, angle, right? <coughs> yeah. From it. Yeah. Cos, cos Z, only that is left. Otherwise, yeah. everything is done. Right? Yeah, everything is already available to us. Okay, okay, okay. So, did someone find what is the reflectance? So, previous recording, I will share the link at the end of the lecture. Uh, I will share all the links. Uh, 0.9129 yeah it is 0 0.91 so what we have found is uh, reflectance so remember one thing reflectance will always be between 0 to 1 so it cannot exceed 1 and it will not be less than 0 so it is either 0 or 100 percent if it is uh, 100 percent it is like a very uh, highly reflective surface you can say a glacier will have a reflectance near to 100 percent and uh, <clears throat> so that is what is uh, given uh, that is what uh, we can uh, find from this question so reflectance will always vary between 0 to 1 
and remember this is uh, top of atmosphere reflectance okay please solve that question solve the question huh? it's just direct substitution right so pi what is the answer so answer is 0.91 so l lambda is given you can directly substitute then this is also given you can directly substitute e sun is uh, 1044 for nir band that is also direct substitution the only conceptual part is how to find the solar zenith angle your sun elevation is given so that is 90 minus uh, what is the uh, 62.6091 it's just direct substitution uh, answer is 0.913 Is it okay? Zero point. Uh, okay. Is it zero point nine one? Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm getting <coughs> it wrong. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So here I have described something called as level one, and in the last week also I mentioned something called as level two. So what is this level 1, level 2 and all that? So that I will explain here. So there are different levels of the satellite data products. So it can be organized into different processing levels. So how much they have processed it, pre-processed it before it uh, comes to us. So these levels indicate the stage of processing, calibration and correction of data. And they provide the information about data quality, geometric accuracy and extent of atmospheric correction that is applied or not applied. So we can, these are the general levels. So L0 data, that is level 0, it is the raw data. So no geometric correction, nothing is done. It is just recorded by the satellite. It is received at the ground station and it comes directly to the user, that is level 0. Then you have level 1. So here what they will do is, they will do the radiometric calibration then ortho rectification that is a geometric correction but it will have the effects of the atmospheric absorption and scattering so level one data will not have atmospheric correction so we need to perform atmospheric correction for the level one data and level two data will be already atmospherically corrected by using the algorithms like uh, atrem matcor flash all these advanced algorithms they will automate they will already correct the data and provide it directly to us and it will be surface reflectance we just have to scale it down and directly use the product so we need no need to perform any atmospheric correction in that case and then we have something called as level 3 data it is one more process so it is uh, by aggregating or compositing data over specific time intervals so you will have temporal data so we have uh, uh, ET products from a modus sensor uh, what is the uh, aggregate ET for 8 days so that data we can directly make use for our analysis and we have level 4 data also further uh, one more higher level of processing and this will be uh, for uh, directly useful for further analysis so everyone clear with this Where do we find all this level 1, <coughs> level 2 directly at in metadata? So, how to find which data is level 1? So, if you see here, so LC08, that means Landsat 8, L1. So, which means level 1. I will, I will uh, describe what is uh, TP. So, initially, uh, during the start of the data itself, you will find this information. So I will share one uh, PDF also. Uh, I think uh, it will be for naming convention of a uh, Sentinel-2, I think. Uh, I will share that uh, PDF. Uh, you can see the naming convention for that. And Landsat also, all satellite products have their own naming conventions. It will be available in their uh, website. So for Landsat, uh, L1 represents the level one. And uh, so this is for the Landsat. So if it is L1 TP, then standard 
terrain correction is already done. So description is like uh, this is from the USGS website only. So it is radiometrically calibrated, ortho rectified using the ground control points and digital elevation data to correct for the relief displacement. So these are the highest quality level one product that is available to us. So we have different uh, L1 GT, L1 GS. So while downloading the data, we should be careful. Uh, we should know what data we are downloading. Okay. So uh, till now we saw what are the levels, then how to convert radiance to reflectance and all this. Then we saw what is atmospheric correction. Now we need to uh, what we got is uh, top of atmosphere reflectance, which means it is not yet atmospherically corrected. Now we are going to perform the atmospheric correction for level 1 data. So what we need to do is, uh, first, uh, whatever values we are seeing, everything is digital number. So these are all scaled up to some threshold, but we need to scale down. So we need to scale it down to 0 to 1. So how we will do that? unscaled surface reflectance is equal to dn into multiplicative factor plus additive factor which i described previously so if it is radiance you should use this factor if it is uh, reflectance you should use this factor so i will uh, just demonstrate uh, for one data how to do that <coughs> so we have uh, one band here so let me take uh, band 5 of uh, Landsat. So we can go to raster, raster calculator. So these are the files which are currently open. So I am going to select band 1, double click on it, then multiply. So what was the factor? So the data which I have downloaded is uh, surface uh, reflectance, top of atmosphere reflectance. So I should multiply it with uh, 2 into 10 power minus 5 and add minus 0.1. So multiply 2 into 10 power minus 5 and I am going to add 0.1. minus 0.1 okay and uh, I need to save the output so I am giving a name and then I am just running it. So, okay, I think, uh, so we have some no data values, so minus uh, 0 0.1 is there, otherwise your uh, value ranges from 0 to 1 only. So we have lot of uh, black pixels here, so those are all 0. So by this we can convert the uh, uh, your uh, scaled upscaled reflectance to downscaling so <clears throat> and before that what we have to do is we have to always correct for the sun angle so before uh, doing this we need to divide it by cos uh, of uh, solar zenith angle and then perform this operation so I just uh, for demonstration I just did directly so we need to perform this uh, correction for sun angle and then you need to do this uh, multiplicative factor and the additive factor understood hello Okay. Uh, we'll what is uh, P lambda negate uh, in the numerator? 
numerator is the uh, your brightness values dn values yeah, yeah but w- what we are finding is same right okay it's after uh, corrections yeah after it is after correction yes okay. yes <clears throat> so p lambda is uh, <coughs> see uh, this uh, p lambda negation is there right uh, yeah this one yeah. yeah so that uh, how we will be getting so that is the pixel values uh, downloaded data raw data the level 1 data okay each value each pixel value then we are dividing each pixel by solar zenith angle okay. and then we will get this uh, 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 reflectance top of atmosphere corrected oh, yeah corrected for the sun angle okay we'll move to the uh, atmospheric correction part so uh, there are several methods and uh, one very common method which uh, generally everybody uh, uses is uh, the dark object subtraction method so it is the most uh, simplest method and the concept is uh, the minimum dn value from the data we will take that and then subtract it from all the pixels so we will see how to do that so here some there are some assumptions so it assumes that reflectance from dark object uh, contains substantial component of atmospheric scattering so dark object means uh, mostly everything is scattered and it has minimal uh, uh, effect of atmosphere so it is just a assumption assumes the existence of zero or small surface reflectance in the scene and the scene should be small enough that the objects in the scene represent to have the similar interaction with the haze so which means whatever pixels uh, you are seeing you are selecting it should be uh, uniform and the entire geographical extent should be uh, small so that every single area will have a similar uh, interaction with your uh, uh, atmospheric uh, will have similar atmospheric effects so we will see the uh, process so first what we need to do is so we will put a false color composite and remember why we are putting false color composite because in the nir band water will be dark in color it will have uh, it will completely absorb the nir wavelength so we will be able to find we will be able to get our dark pixels from this particular uh, false color composite and we will locate uh, such dark pixels and then we will find out what is the reflectance uh, top of atmosphere for each of the pixel so for the entire band set we will find out what is the value for that particular pixel and we will subtract it with the entire set and finally what we will get is all your dark pixels will be subtracted and we will get the surface reflectance free from atmospheric effects so this can be done uh, using manually or by using a separate plugin the entire process is automated so it is just like a click of the button only so everyone understood uh, the process so if you have some doubt you can ask me here hello why uh, yeah uh, see, uh, here uh, yes so this method this method assumes that the dark parts of the image includes uh, like uh, the effects of atmospheric scattering and uh, all this uh, dark objects uh, will have uniform amount of uh, atmospheric interaction and uh, if we subtract such pixels we will remove the we will be able to remove the entire uh, atmospheric effect from all the other pixels sir 
where we can find the recordings of the this live session yeah i will share it i'll share the link uh, towards the end of the session okay sir thank you can you please go to the next slide if you have yeah yeah see here in the first part right when we say the darkest darkest pixel that yes. means uh, uh, we are considering the dn value right yeah dn value dn value then if it is the darkest then i think it would be around uh, uh, maybe like 0 to 10 values right yeah it will be close to 0 so whatever we are uh, seeing here all these values are converted to reflectance so until this part we will perform already so it will be between 0 to 1 only all okay. the dn values and then identify the darkest pixel in all yeah. band so yeah. probably like we need to compare all the bands and then we need to pick <coughs> one band uh, one pixel which has uh, very close to 0 not uh, we what we will do is uh, that's why i am i have not put a point here i have put a circle so what we will do is we will find out the average value of this particular area small area and then we will find out the average and across all the bands so for each band we will find what is the darkest pixel and then we will subtract it with respect to the uh, corresponding band okay okay so it it is uh, per band basis yeah per uh, band basis yes okay and then finally we will get the uh, result <clears throat> okay i will just uh, quickly perform uh, the atmospheric correction using the uh, scp plugin so uh, to install the plugin so first we need to go to plugins manage and install plugin and uh, here you should go to not installed and then if you search uh, okay you can keep it all here you can keep it all and search semi automatic classification plugin so this is the name of the plugin so you can click and if you see uh, here currently it is uninstalled uh, so you can you will install just you need to click it it will run and it will install so once this one is installed so if you go here make a right click so this uh, i just made a right click in that place and you can see uh, the panels so if you come here you will have scp edit toolbar scp working toolbar then you have dock panel and you have several other panels so this is one way to uh, uh, look at the plugin the other way is you have a separate uh, window itself here you have a separate menu itself here scp so i am just opening so this is the plugin this is how it looks like and then if you come here you can see a tab called as pre processing so i clicked on that and you can see the different uh, satellite uh, products that are available so what i'm going to remove uh, do is i'm going to remove uh, the band which i calculated and then i will have only these four bands okay <clears throat> now what i'm going to do is so here we need to select the multi band image list so currently nothing is there so we can open the file from here also so we just have to go to the folder where our data is located and then we need to select each band separately so i am selecting all the tif files and you can give open so you can see so since i already had it open everything is like two two times uh, coming here so i will uh, remove everything so let's do it uh, from the start so pre processing i am going to open the data so band 2 to band 5 i have opened it so it has come here also and if you see here 
we need to select the particular satellite so you have wavelength quick settings so here we need to go and then this is landsat 8 so we have landsat 7 4 5 then sentinel modus most of the satellite products will be there so this is landsat 8 so i have selected once i select it will take the multiplicative factor additive factor everything automatically and then Here we can create a virtual band set also. So now I clicked on the Landsat and we need to select the Landsat band. Okay, I have some other files also. So, what I did is I located this particular folder inside the semi automatic classification plugin. So, whatever the image file it recognizes as a TIFF file, and uh, all these files got loaded. So, I only need the first four. So, rest of the things I made for uh, some other study. So, I will remove all that. So I have removed it and uh, here you can see apply DOS1 atmospheric correction, create band set and use band set tools. This uh, we can create later also and uh, use uh, value as no data. So if there is any no data, it will make it as a zero and then I'm just going to run this. So before that, we need to choose the metadata file also. So when we when I choose the metadata, so it will find out the parameters automatically. So MTL is the metadata. Okay, this came again. So I have chosen the metadata and uh, all the bands are now loaded. And just I'm going to give run. And I need to locate the output folder. I located the output folder. <coughs> okay, there is some error with the folder and its file names. I'm going to band processing, pre-processing, Landsat and then I'm selecting the folder where the files are located. So that is the folder and then I'm going to locate the metadata. Okay, so all this uh, values came automatically from the metadata. So you have the multiplication coefficient, radiance then reflectance and all constants loaded automatically now we can run it so i am selecting the same folder for the output and uh, you can see behind it is running now 
so previously i think uh, since there were other files in the folder it uh, threw an error now it is running so it will take some uh, time okay it has completed so you can see now so these are the bands uh, if i go to the so you can see right it varies from 0 to 1 for all the images and uh, after this we can create the virtual stack also so let me quickly create So 4, 3 and 2. I am applying a false color composite. So you can see this image now. And then let me show the original image. So I will create a stack for the original image also. So LC08 is the original image. I am selecting the first four. Then four, three and two. So I am uh, hiding all the other layers. So this is the original false color composite and uh, if i just hide it you can see the atmospherically corrected false color composite you can see the removal in the haze right so you can see the difference there is a tremendous difference so this is how you can perform dark object uh, subtraction in qgis by using the uh, scp plugin so anybody has uh, any doubts Hello. Hello. No, sir. Okay. So this is how you can uh, atmospherically correct using dark object subtraction. You can uh, try it out uh, by watching the video once again. Uh, I'll I, I have I'll share the link for the data set also. Okay, we can go with the presentation. <clears throat> okay, next is the geometric error. So here, uh, why geometric error occurs is uh, because <clears throat> directly below the nadir point, uh, your satellite is viewing perpendicular, and uh, for the other sites, uh, the satellite has a different uh, field of view. And uh, usually the buildings uh, we can see, uh, ideally it should be uh, like this, but because the sensor looks at the other way, and you can see the uh, uh, bottom of the buildings also. So that that is called as a relief uh, displacement. We will come to that. So we need to correct for this atmospheric correction. So why it is important? Because for the accurate spatial analysis, this is needed. So if you are going to calculate area or distance, or if you want to uh, get some other information, we need to uh, ensure that it is geometrically corrected. So there are two types. One is the internal geometric error and the external geometric error. So internal geometric error is produced because of the satellite itself and in combination with the that's rotation or the curvature. So these errors are systematic. It can be identified easily and we can correct it by using the pre-launch or in-flight platform itself. And some of these errors are skew because your satellite uh, will move from uh, north to south in case of polar satellites. And at the same time, your Earth is also rotating from west to east. So your satellite uh, will record the data like this, but actually, uh, it would have moved further. So that is called as image skew. And 
we will have variation in the ground resolution because of the scanning system because of no other view uh, we know that uh, the field of view is a little bigger and the pixels will not be exactly square it will be rectangular and we will have one dimensional relief, relief displacement and we will have the tangential scale distortion so and external geometric errors uh, they are non systematic difficult to identify and it is caused generally because of the altitude or the attitude change of the platform so sometimes your altitude of the platform will increase or decrease because of some reason and attitude change which is nothing but uh, uh, this image describes the attitude of the uh, platform so your sensor uh, might uh, yaw that is move left or right like this when moving in the orbit or it can make its uh, nose down towards the earth or away from the earth that is called as uh, pitch and it will also roll in its orbit so because of that uh, we can see uh, some kinds of error this is the actual ground scene and uh, this is the scanner image and because of roll your uh, recorded data might so look something like this and because of uh, wind it can have a yaw effect yaw effect uh, create this uh, crab distortion and if the satellite moves uh, like uh, forward or uh, the backward with respect to the uh, flight direction the line of flight it will produce compressed or expanded image like this so you can see uh, more in detail in this particular image so if it rolls to the left the direction in which it is rolling it will have a compression and the other end will have the expansion so it is uh, this is when it rolls to the left this is when it rolls to the right and if it uh, looks down so the face the uh, the point at which where it is looking down it will have a compression effect and the uh, background will have the expansion effect and if it moves left and right your image the your entire image will be captured like this your actual image you intend to capture it in this way but because of the yaw effect it has captured something like this so these are the changes in the attitude now we need to correct this geometric error and uh, we can correct it by using the ground control points so these are the points which are in the ground uh, it may be some uh, static object so it should not uh, change with time for example your uh, river channels cannot be a ground control point because uh, your uh, river will change its course or your bank of the river will change depending on the kind of flow it happens so that is not a point your buildings are usually static and uh, some uh, the road intersections the major road intersections these are all some static uh, uh, points which we can uh, which can potentially become a ground control point and uh, to understand this we need to uh, know about two set of coordinates one is the image coordinate and the second one is the map coordinate so image coordinate uh, will uh, will be like a positive negative it will be in the cartesian form of coordinate system it can be positive or the negative the general graph what we are dealing with and second one is the map coordinate these are all actual latitude longitude or it can be easting or northing so this will be always uh, greater than 0 it cannot be in uh, negative uh, this you should remember and uh, these coordinate pairs we need to uh, identify so i'll uh, demonstrate how to identify that and we have two types of correction one is image to map rectification and image to image registration we will see what is that and mostly for our studies we will perform image to map rectification so in a very 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 crude way just for everyone to understand for the beginners to understand so i have just put this uh, uh, images here so consider your data as this black sheet or this uh, white sheet and we need to stretch this or skew this or rotate this or move it such that this data fits into this uh, particular drawing board so that is our reference so you can do whatever you want but this data should fit in this board 
and how we will make it to fit we are going to use some points these are the pins by which it is going to hold and these points are the ground control points so everyone clear with this yes sir <coughs> so yes, sir. here consider your data as a elastic sheet we are going to stretch it rotate or translate so that it fits onto this drawing board and how do we fit it we are going to pin it by using the uh, gcp points this is the very easiest way to understand you just have to remember this so now let's move on to the technical part so first is the image to map rectification so this is your map so consider this as your uh, topo sheet uh, which can be obtained from survey of india and uh, in that map you have uh, identified your gcp points this 14 13 and 16 are your gcp points so this is your actual day actual uh, reference and this is your satellite image now we are going to stretch this data so that this image fits exactly in this particular reference data so we need to identify the common points so the same 14 13 and 16 we need to identify in this particular image as well so this is the image coordinate and this is the map coordinate okay so that is the first type of uh, geometric correction second type is uh if you see uh, landsat 4 uh, or 5 data it has started long back uh, sometime in the 1990s or 2000 early 2000 and if you see landsat 8 uh, it started uh, sometime around 2014 or 15 so the, uh, they these two satellites will cover some part of the ground and gender sometimes what will happen is uh, they will not uh, cover uh, they will not exactly capture the same extent that is the same uh, uh, it will not be in the same format so sometimes it may be tilted sometimes it may be like uh, how to explain so let's say if this is landsat 4 data and this is landsat 8 data so sometimes what will happen is uh, your landsat 8 would have captured something like this but uh, you are going to make use of these two data together and uh, ideally it should overlay on top of one another so for that what we will do is we will take one image as the reference so let's take uh, four as reference and this as the data we will do the same process what we did in the image to map rectification except that we will identify the common features between this two data so we will identify common features from this and common features from this locate it and then do the uh, geometric correction so that it overlays on top of one another so that is called as image to image registration so um, so while doing this there are two processes involved one is the spatial interpolation and another one is the intensity interpolation so in spatial interpolation your location is changing and in the intensity interpolation your brightness values also will be modified so first we will see for the spatial interpolation so we need to identify what is the relationship between the given input and the map coordinates and for that we need to select the uh, gcp points and we will use uh, some mathematical model to uh, fit our data to the reference so what it does is it fits the polynomial equations such that the root mean square error is minimum ideally it should be less than 0.5 pixels and acceptable is uh, it should be less than 1 pixel so if you choose a uh, uh, polynomial of first degree let's say linear fitting so uh, how do you know how many points you should select so number of minimum points that is needed for that particular algorithm to run is capital n is the number of points n plus 1 into n plus 2 into 0.5 so where small n is the order of the polynomial and capital n is the number of gcp points that is needed 
So if you are choosing one, so if I substitute one here, so that's two, three, six. So I need minimum three points for a, a first order polynomial to fit in. So similarly, you can calculate for whichever order you want to fit. And you can see this is the observation. If you fit a linear line, it is something like a linear line. So these are all the errors. That is the RMSE. You can calculate from this the RMSE and it should be minimum and quadratic. So this is how the fit and this is for cubic. And this is how the fit is for the cubic. So second one is the intensity interpolation. So for this, we have uh, uh, three different types of uh, there are other methods also, but here we are seeing nearest neighbor, bilinear and cubic convolution. So in bilinear, what it does is it will take the four nearest points and then it will compute. So this z is your brightness value. D is the distance from the center to the point which is nearest. So and then we can compute the what is the corresponding brightness. And for bilinear, it will take average from 16 neighboring pixels and then it will apply the corresponding value in the corrected image. So this uh, process of uh, intensity interpolation is also called as uh, resampling. Okay. Now uh, I want everyone to take some time and then calculate the brightness value by using the bilinear interpolation. So what you need to do is you need to find out what is the uh, the distance value from this point to all the four corners and then substitute the value of z and then find out the brightness value. Okay, there is one data that is missing. So each pixel side is 30 meters. So this, uh, this distance is 30 meters and this is the midpoint where the two diagonals uh, intersect. So you can consider the center point to be the midpoint at this intersection.
it two seven one double eight. What is the answer? Uh, two seven one double eight. What I am doing is uh, uh, summing the four uh, the values which are on the picture, and okay. then divided by t square k. That is thirty whole square. Thirty square. But yeah, because d square, uh, d square k is the distance. Distance, pixel, right? No, distance from the center of this point to this particular value. Yeah, that means thirty meters. Uh, is it thirty meter? Each pixel size. Okay, you are saying each pixel size is thirty meters. Yes. So it is fifteen meters, sir. Uh, it is not fifteen meter, also. See, it is. Uh, if you see here, wait. I will solve. Uh, just give me two minutes. So you can see my screen, right? Yeah. So this is the center point. So this resolution is uh, thirty meters. So if I, this is a midpoint, right? So this will be fifteen meters, and uh, this will be fifteen meters. So this is the distance that we want. So it is like uh, if you take this as theta, just apply your Pythagoras theorem. So your hypotenuse will be opposite square plus adjacent square. So your hypotenuse value will be fifteen root two meters. Right. So this is your uh, uh, distance from this point to the all four points, and then we have the brightness values. So it is two double seven, two six, two eight zero four two. Then you have two seven five two three, two seven one. Double eight. Now our formula is uh, summation 
z that is the brightness value divided by the distance divided by summation of 1 by d square for all the i points so here since the distance is common you can take 1 by d square outside and you will have summation of z values divided by here if i take 1 by d square outside you have four points so remaining will be 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 so you can just directly cancel the 1 by d square because it is the same so it will be the average of all the pixels so that will be 27726 plus 28042 plus 27523 plus 27110 so one, 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 by 4 okay so what is the answer so it is coming around 27 619.75 so this will be yeah so so this is the value of the center pixel by bilinear interpolation okay so this is uh, one type of uh, interpolation so now can you try to solve uh, uh, the second question uh, I will share the screen. Now, can you solve this question? So, it is a cubic convolution. So, it is like the next higher level of interpolation. It will take the pixel from 16 adjacent pixels. So here when you are taking the distance, you should be careful. So this is the center pixel for which we want the value. And uh, this distance you know how to calculate. Just now we saw that in the bilinear interpolation. And from this point, so from this point to this point, again you can calculate by using the same principle. The uh, Pythagoras theorem itself we can use and uh, the distance from this point to this point is given because we cannot directly uh, calculate that by using the geometric properties so I have measured it and I have given it as approximately 47 meters so can you quickly calculate this and uh, tell me the answer
Hello. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, I want to ask that how this uh, minus forty seven is present. That is not minus forty seven. That is approximately forty seven, not minus forty seven. Oh, okay. Sir, how it is measured? So I measured it by using a QGIS uh, for just for calculation purpose. Okay. This is like a contour map. Ah, uh, not a contour map. These are uh, brightness values. Ah, yes, the so, brightness values, but uh, sim similar type map <laughs> is there. I don't think so. Sir, for finding out the uh, center of the four uh, four points of a single pixel. We have to do the average of all the four values. Center point. Uh, ah, that is what we are doing. Uh, these are all like uh, uh, different interpolation methods. So first we use bilinear interpolation. This is cubic convolution. Uh, it is not necessarily average. Uh, in previous, it was like average because uh, we had only like uh, four pixels. The distance was same for all the points. So it was like average. It is not average. Sir, this this is done directly in QGIS. Yeah, these are all algorithms just by click of a button. Just to have a like a, a feel of calculating something, uh, I have just made it as a problem. Okay. Just to understand how it is calculating. Uh, how the software is calculating. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sir, is this type of questions comes in final exam? <laughs> Uh, up to bilinear, I think it is possible, uh, but uh, cubic is a uh, uh, little calculation intensive, so uh, it might not appear. Okay, okay. Thank you. So anyone solved it? So doing so. Okay. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, in this, what is Z? Z X Z K. Z is the brightness value. This. Okay. Uh, so in this uh, equation, we have to take maximum value or minimum value. No, no, summation of everything. You can see the sum, right? So it is summation of uh, each and everything. All the points. Summation yeah. of all the points. Yeah. Okay. And sir, what what is D K? Distance from the center pixel to each pixel. So this distances. So each pixel means here we have to find out the distance of each point from this central central dot. Yeah, yeah. So it is simple only. First, what you do, you find from this center to this point. So this three points will have the same distance. Then you find from this point to this point. Then all the other corners will have the same distance. Then from this point to this point, I have given this point to this point is same. This also is same, so you can just directly calculate. 
you just have to find this distance and uh, this point to this point this distance can you do it uh, by selecting diagonal yeah yeah you, you have to do like that only And this is already done in this QGIS, yeah? Yeah, it will be already done. Uh, it's all click off a button only. Okay, Sir, uh, one more question is there. This DK is the average of all the points from the uh, center. No, no, no. It is distance, not average. So here we have to find out DV of each and every point. No, no. Only the center point. Only the central point. So, 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 sir, for on, uh, only finding out the central point, what what will be the DK? so you are first uh, from center to this point so this will be the first dk value okay uh, yes, then sir. then from uh, where is my cursor so then from this point to this point so this will be the second distance then for the other points i have given directly 47 meters Okay. Okay, okay, sir. Well, finally, uh, last, last outer outer square points uh, we have to calculate like this. Yeah. And inner one we have to calculate, and then these two, so forty-seven is written. Yes, it is. Are, so here, sir, D K in this B V. You have to find out the value of all the points from this central point. Yeah, I will just uh, share the solution shortly. You can understand from that. so you can see no <clears throat> so what i have did is <clears throat> first i calculated uh, d1 value so that is uh, 15 square plus 15 square square root of that so like the previous uh, uh, problem how we did so this this concept so and i have calculated um, this as uh, 15 root 2 okay so if uh, this is 15 root 2 similarly you will have another midpoint here this will be another 15 root 2 this will be another 15 root 2 so this will be 3 times 15 root 2 understood so i am saying the easy way of calculating 
or you can uh, consider yeah. the outer one as a square and then you can find out by using the pythagoras theorem again now once you okay, find but, the but yeah. one second here uh, yes. sorry to interrupt yeah in the previous uh, we have uh, explicitly stated that uh, from the point the middle point to the uh, next immediate uh, uh, corner point is 30 The distance between two two uh, yeah. like center to the other pixel is the yes. 30 meters. But yeah. here we haven't stated that. Is it something we have to assume that? Ah oh, no, I actually Or it didn't. Same? Okay, I didn't give it. Yes, okay. exactly. Actually, I I also thought that out of that approximate 47 meters, we have to find that height. No, no, no. Here also pixel size is 30 meter. That I didn't give. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is it something assumption or like it remains same for every every kind of problem we have like this? No, this is your spatial resolution of the satellite. So this is Landsat data. So it is thirty meter spatial no, resolution. No, no, no. Like distance, distance. I mean to say. No, it will vary because here it is everything is thirty meter, thirty meter. So you have nine pixels. So this uh, each is thirty meter. Okay. So here everything is thirty meter by thirty meter only. So you have nine pixels of thirty meter by thirty meter. So that is how you can. So find. other images as well also will have same distance. You mean to say, or is there any such standard we have uh, for each image we have? No, it's all from the spatial resolution of the satellite only. Okay, okay, okay. based on the resolution, <coughs> right? Number yeah. of uh, pixels uh, will uh, define that uh, distance. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So now. we calculated the distance and 47 meter is already known to us so what i have done is i have grouped uh, this first four pixels so the interior pixels i have made summation of all the brightness values divided by the distance dk okay then second part what i have done is i have taken the Outer four pixels. I have made a summation of the brightness values divided by corresponding decay values. Understood? And for the other pixels, that is this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, the distance is forty-seven uh, meters from the center. I have divided it. I have made the summation of brightness by dk square so this is the numerator and denominator we just have to count the number of this is 1 divided by dk square summation of 1 by dk square so we have four pixels having the distance of 15 root 2 square four pixels having the distance of uh, 45 root 2 square and eight pixels having 47 square so if you solve this you can get your brightness value for the center pixel so understood i think uh, you can calculate it now so in general just <coughs> for the uh, other one right uh, bilinear interpolation probably we are expecting those kind of problems in the examination right Problem. So in that right, explicitly the distance between two pixels will be given, or we should assume it should be given. It should be given. Okay. 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 Uh, I think you can calculate it. Uh, so it is two six seven six one point nine four. Okay. I have not calculated uh, because I need to finish uh, the other part also. So you can calculate it. Okay, let's move on to the final part. <clears throat> okay, next thing is the uh, relief displacement calculation of relief displacement. Uh, we got to know the uh, by off track uh, across track scanners will have the relief displacement. So this is the relief displacement which we are talking about. Uh, here both the bottom and the top of the building will be visible, and the relief displacement is measured with respect to the principal point, that is your another point directly uh, below the line of flight. So we will we need to uh, uh, find 
uh, this will be given in the question. This is the radial distance and uh, your platform is at some altitude. And uh, either we need to find out what is the relief displacement or we need to find out uh, what is the height of the building by using the relief displacement. So this is how uh, the relief displacement uh, works. So we have the uh, camera that is our platform here and it is looking down and he here is our object and this is the ground plane and if we track this point to our uh, camera's exposure point it will intersect in this uh, plane where we are uh, capturing the image so that point we are uh, keeping it as a b and then we are measuring what is its distance from the center and what is the point distance of point a and distance of point b from this uh, uh, principal plane and uh, if we take the difference of that we will get what is the our small d that is the relief displacement value and by making use of the principle of similar triangles so they are taking the triangle <coughs> so by making use of principle uh, that is the similar triangles so h by capital h that is your uh, they are taking this thing. Um, they are taking this one triangle and uh, this small triangle which is inside you can see this no so these two triangles they are making the similar triangles and then we are arriving at the height of the building so here what we can see is uh, the relief displacement is proportional to the distance <coughs> that is the difference in the elevation between the top of the object and the local data so your relief displacement is directly proportional to this uh, point from where you are measuring you are directly proportional to your capital H and it is also directly proportional to the radial distance from the principal plane so as you go up and up so your relief displacement will vary directly to the uh, with your uh, height from which you are measuring and it is inversely proportional to the altitude so if you keep the equation small d is equal to h into r by capital h so this is what we are saying directly proportional to the difference between the elevation and directly proportional to the radial distance inversely proportional to the altitude so now you can solve this particular question um, the sensor is exposed to ground scene from an altitude of uh, 3000 meter above the ground level so this is your capital H that is given and after obtaining the image we measured this uh, distance by using the uh, equipments that are available for photogrammetry and uh, we found the relief displacement to be 0.13 centimeters so this is your small d and uh, they have measured this radial distance from the principal point also and this was 2.25 centimeter in the photograph that they have captured so this is your radial distance now can you calculate the height of the building so your uh, height of the building is equal to it is just direct substitution so this is the equation d into h by r so can you quickly calculate and tell me
173.33. Yeah, it is 173.3 meters. So by using this uh, principle, uh, it is just concept of similar triangles. You can calculate what is the relief displacement. So now let us see uh, how the georeferencing works. So I am going to open one uh, image that is aerial photo. So as I uh, move around my mouse, you can see the coordinate below. So this is the coordinate. So I am going to go to this point, the corner. So that is 0, 0. And if I move towards the left, it is minus. Everything is minus. That is your second quadrant. If I move below, that is your fourth quadrant. If I move to this side, that is your third quadrant. So this kind of coordinate system, what you are seeing here is called as image coordinate. So it can be positive and negative. And if you see here, so the layer has no coordinate reference system. So we don't know where it is lying. So if I put the Google satellite, So your Google satellite is somewhere here and then if I move to the zoom to layer, this image is somewhere. So we don't know where it is. Now what we need to do, we need to georeference it so that it is in the proper coordinate system. So how do we do that? By selecting the ground control points. So let me open one more thing. So I'm going to open this particular uh, shape file. It's a vector file. We will see towards the end of the course what is that. So it is asking for the projection system. So I'm just going to click OK. So we will see what is projection and all later. So now I'm going to put the satellite. So now you can Google satellite image. So you can see this is the lake. And now I'm moving my uh, mouse. So you can see it is in positive 63,000 something and 3 lakh something. So wherever I move my mouse, it will it will be always in the positive only. So it will not have uh, negative coordinates as such. So we have got the this uh, this uh, the image which I open should be in this place, but it is not in that place. So now we are going to bring that. So for that, we need something called as a georeferencer plugin. Again, go to plugins and you need to install. If I do georeferencer, okay. Um, this plugin is, I think, directly available here. Okay. So if you go to raster, in the older versions, we need to install separately. Uh, I think this is a different version of QJS. So here it is available. So raster georeferencer. So I'm going to open this. So it will open a new window. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to open my image which I opened in the uh, previous. So I'm going to open the this aerial photo which I showed in the uh, uh, another file. So I'm going to open this image. So I opened it. So now this is our uh, georeferencing window. Now we need to find out the common points. So if I see, um, so I'm zooming into the lake. So we have the spillway. Uh, so this spillway is not going to change as long as the dam is available. So this is the add point. So we need to click this, then 
I am going to keep at one corner and then it will open this dialog box. <coughs> now what we are going to do, if we know the latitude and longitude of that, we can give directly here. So we don't know the latitude and longitude. So we need to choose from map canvas. So whatever you see behind, that is the map canvas. So from map canvas and uh, I'm going to move to the same place. So this is the spillway and this corner point I selected. So zoom in as close as possible and then select that point. So it will take the coordinates. So coordinates came automatically and then I click OK. So it will start uh, accumulating like this. So I'm going to select one more coordinate, uh, the left spillway again from the map canvas. So this point. So similarly, we need to select the ground control points. So here we should not select the lake uh, boundary because uh, it will change uh, if the water is there. If the water is not there, it will be a different boundary. So we can go to uh, go and select uh, this kind of intersections. So I'm going to select uh, the center of this particular intersection. So I'm going to the map canvas and I'm going to locate the same intersection, this center. Click OK. So like that, I will select number of GCP points. So how you should select? You should select in such a way that the points are distributed in this entire uh, image. So all your points should not be here alone. So you should have some points in this corner also, this corner also, this corner also. So we need to do like that. So I have already done this for my assignment. So I'm going to load those points. You can see that. So you can see the red, red dots, right? So these are all the GCB points, which I have chosen. So I think some points will be visible. It's not visible here. Okay. So once you select the points, so you will have number of points here. So there are 12 points. So you can select as much as you want, but the number of minimum points you should know, like how much. So I'm going to go polynomial one, minimum number of points that are needed is uh, only three points, but I have chosen 12 points and resampling method. So you can see here, whatever we discussed, cubic is there, linear is there, and then cubic spline is there, then land course, another one method. So I'm going to go with the nearest neighbor itself and target SRS, spatial reference system. So that we need to choose properly. So this map is going to uh, place, uh, sit on which uh, uh, projection system. So we have different zones. Right now this is in America. So you can see this number here, 26914. I'm going to locate that particular coordinate reference system, 26914. And I'm going to select that. So this North America came into picture. I'm just going to click OK. And I'm going to save the GCP points. And this is the name of the file. And uh, you need to select this so that uh, the map will be loaded. So I'm just going to click OK now. And uh, at the bottom, you can see the mean error. So the mean error is uh, 0 0.37261. So it is less than 0.5. It is ideal for us to proceed with the georeferencing. So once uh, you select and your error is less than the acceptable value, you can just start georeferencing and uh, georeferencing completed. So if I close this now, you can see the image has come here. So now I am going to see how it has fitted. So just I am zooming to the spillway point. So you can see still there is some shift you can see. So it is little bit towards the right because all the points were concentrated on the top left of it. So you can see how the georeferencing has come. It is not a very good georeferencing, but uh, yeah, it has uh, done at least with the lake boundary, uh, it has uh, matched very well. 
so you can see so this is how we can uh, perform georeferencing in uh, QGIS and this is called as image to map rectification Be the, the image is the Google satellite picture and uh, your map is the uh, Google satellite and your image is the uh, one for which you need to do the georeferencing. So everyone understood that? Yes sir, but uh, I want to know what is the best resampling method <coughs> So your best resampling method will be the nearest neighbor because it is going to give you the most accurate result because it is it will sample from your uh, neighboring pixels. So if this is the pixel, it will sample from your neighboring pixels itself. But if you go for cubic, it will take 16 pixels and then find out the uh, this point. So less the number of uh, points, the more will be the brightness value accuracy. But in case of uh, spatial, uh, that is spatial interpolation, your GCP should be uh, proper. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So that is how you can do the georeferencing. I will share this data set also. You can try georeferencing it. And uh, this is the last part of uh, today's lecture. This is related to the radiometric error. So you need to find this uh, uh, missing pixel value. So in the uh, video lecture, I think uh, there was a similar uh, problem. You can take a 3x3 three three window and then you can find out what is the missing pixel by taking the average of the neighboring pixel. So for this, the 3x3 three three window will be this particular box. And for Z, this will be this 3 by 3. And for Y, you have to take this window. Then you calculate the average of uh, the values. Divided by 8 pixels. So that will be x, y and z. So you just need to compute the average of uh, this 8 pixels and then you can find out. So can you quickly calculate? So you can round it off to uh, nearest integer. So this will be 37, this will be 34, and this can be 37. So you can round it off to the uh, nearest integer value. So by this we can correct the random bad pixels. So everything, uh, is everyone clear with this problem? Sir. So today, uh, that is the end of today's session. So we have seen how to stack, what is true color composite, what is false color composite.
then we have seen what is atmospheric correction and we saw how to do atmospheric correction using the SCP plugin in QJS and then we saw how to do georeferencing uh, in QJS and uh, many people have asked for uh, the links let me just uh, quickly share it hello yes hello sir is there, uh, uh, that question please explain so one minute please ask one question just uh, you have explained right Yeah, if you have seen in the video lecture, uh, how to correct a missing uh, bad pixel, that is because of a radiometric uh, error. So what we will do is we will take a 3 by 3 window, that is center pixel, uh, box of 9 pixels will be there. And we need to calculate the average value of the surrounding 9 pixel. So if this is the pixel surrounding 8 pixels, we will calculate the average. Written here. What? Yes. So, yes, sir. So, average of this is written in X. Yeah, yeah. 52 plus 25, so on up to 52, divided by 8. Divided by 8, and that is the value of X. Okay. Yeah, similarly for Y and similarly for Z. Okay, okay, sir. Understood. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I think many of you have answered. You should round off to the nearest integer. Okay, I will share the links. Uh, just a minute. Can I ask something last Yeah, you can ask. So, just a minute. So I have shared the meeting link, the YouTube channel link, where it will be, uh, where the videos will be uploaded, and the Google Drive link where uh, the data sets which I have used, then uh, the recordings also will be available. You can download that also, and then PPT also will be available. Uh, so I have shared it in the message. You can save it somewhere, and then. Let me quickly go through the link. So this is the Google Drive folder. So you can see uh, there is a week one. Uh, you can see that. And QJS tutorials I have uploaded. You can start going through this parallelly. So here you have theory as well as the tutorials. Uh, you can practice by yourself uh, right now. Uh, later on, we will see the QJS. I think uh, video lectures will be available. So when it comes, I will uh, explain that. And then week two, so tutorial data set. So I have given georeferencing data set here. Then Landsat data I have given. Then this is the SCP uh, plugin manual. Then you have the uh, tutorial manual for how to stack and somebody asked me where to download the data. So the link is given in this particular file, earthexplorer.usgs.gov. You have to register yourself. Uh, that, uh, that steps are also given in this. And then you can, how to search also is given. And then you can uh, download the data from here. And this is uh, how to make the stack. That tutorial is available. And then how to convert the digital number to top of atmosphere reflectance. How to do that in QJS. That steps are also given. Then how to convert the top of atmosphere reflectance to the surface reflectance. Atmospheric correction. That tutorial is also given in here. So that is everything is in the Google Drive. You can save it. Okay. Uh, I'll stop the recording now.